Alright all you glorious gamers out there, welcome to the Players 2 podcast, the video game podcast for gamers like you, by gamers like you. You can follow Players 2 on all the social media, that's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, the lot. You can also find our written content over at players2.com, that's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S-T-O-O.com. And if you could take five seconds to give us five stars over on Apple Podcasts, that is really, 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 really appreciated. It does a huge amount for the exposure of the show, and thank you to anyone that's already done that for us. Again, it really helps us out, and if you like anything that you hear here, please take five seconds to go and give us five stars. It really, really helps us out. All right, and on with the show. My name is Mark Henderson. With me, as always, Mr. Lewis Camley. How's it going, Lewis? It's going not bad at all, Mark. Um, It's been a long week, pretty tiring week, but good to be here doing the show again. How are you doing? I am doing fine. I platinum control. Nice one. Good stuff. I know. I was pretty pleased about it. What was involved in platinum it? Not a lot, man. Honestly, like quite frankly, it's a really easy platinum. I only ever platinum really easy games. <laughs> um, a lot of people have, would have platinum Spider Man had they played it. I would say it's on a level with that. It's a lot of kind of collecting stuff, like doing a certain amount of missions, certain kind of type of missions a yeah. number of times. They have those uh, what are called countermeasures in the game, which is kind of like kill five guys via headshot in this area go and then you get a wee tick box and you have to do like 25 of them and then there's the timed events that come up and you have to do like five of them then complete all the side missions and then that's basically you yeah 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 just fill out the skill tree you're away (laughs) no bother um i didn't do any countermeasures or the bureau alerts while i was playing the game i done one yeah are they are they any good does it offer a new challenge or anything or the countermeasures no not really i that was by far the most tedious part of it. <laughs> some of the timed events were quite interesting because you actually ended up getting in quite difficult fights mm-hmm, sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I didn't mind them. They, they were okay. But the main thing is just doing all the side missions. Like the side missions were really good. Yeah. I thoroughly enjoyed doing the side missions. Definitely worth the time. And quite frankly, it won't take you a lot of time to do it. See if you've just went through the process of completing the game. Mm-hmm. I would say that you're a good 80% of the way there. Like quite genuinely, your trophy count might be about 80. <laughs> so you've also completed it as well now though. So also both completed, completed it. Yeah. It. Yeah, I just, how are you feeling about it, man? Well, as we recorded last week, I was basically finished it, and I just had that final battle to do. And it really, as I said before, like it really left a sour taste in my mouth the end of the game. But I don't want that to cloud my whole memory of it. And I think I will go back and I might not platinum it, but I might do the rest of the side missions that I still had. Hanging I'd recommend doing the side missions, man. Yeah, that is one hundred percent worth your time. I think that they add really interesting things, like story wise, to that world, and they've got one hundred percent interesting challenges. 100%. Some of the there's like boss fights within some of them that are that are pretty good. So. Yeah, for those things, I think I would go back and play it, and I think that that would allow me to kind of put the game away finally and be like, that was good. We, we won't spoil the ending mm. of the game, but I would say the ending is a big, massive, damp squib. It doesn't end well at all, I wouldn't say. It, it just kind of stops, mm-hmm. you know? There's no big climax, basically, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Which is quite disappointing, considering how the, the rest of the game is, and you think that it's all building up to this great crescendo that never really comes. Yeah. So yeah, I kind of agree with you. I think that had I stopped playing at that point, I just put it away and that was it done for me. I, I probably would have felt quite, not, not bitter, bitter is the wrong word, but I wouldn't have felt as great about it as I do now because I feel I've platinumed it and it's one of the only platinums I have. I think I have like a total of five platinums yeah. and I just feel quite good that it's now a game that I've platinumed. Yeah, so but I you can't let that change your view. <laughs> no, no, but it's just, it's just not ending on that sour note, mm-hmm. you know? It's, it was a great game. I, I maintain that the combat is tremendously fun and very, very satisfying. I had no problem continuing to play through that, but it's just the story from what I thought was ramping up and being really interesting kind of really fizzled out really mm. badly. Um, the technical issues were still a thing throughout the playthrough. But the world as well, I, I know that you were a big fan of the world. Uh, it's just superb, like, just to travel around in. The, the whole brutalist architecture of it is just a really, really interesting choice that I think that they've pulled off really well. It's just that they've not pulled off other bits of the no. game that well at all, yeah. unfortunately. But yeah. I, I thought like narratively at the end, it felt extremely rushed and the gameplay felt like it was making sort of the easiest decisions to make in order just to get you to the end. I think we sort of said it before, but it just feels like everything about this game was like a mad dash to the finish line at the end like feels like things were probably cut feels like they could have taken longer to fix some of the technical issues so yeah if they'd given themselves like six months more development time maybe i do really believe that maybe the fact that this game wasn't published by again i used mm-hmm, activision mm-hmm. as an example and it's published by a smaller publisher called uh, 505 games I, again i am 100 percent behind supporting smaller publishers 100 percent. but i just think that this game might have been a bit beyond yeah. their means 
and I think there may have been too ambitious a project for them. I love that they tried it, and God, they again, they are ninety percent there to being brilliant, but that ten percent is like, like it falls hard, mm. you know. Absolutely. Speaking of falling hard, <laughs> um, <laughs> amazing, amazing segue, Lewis. Absolutely tremendous. Continue. Uh, I have been playing uh, a little game on Apple Arcade, um, which I'm still within my free month of, called What the Golf. I have also been playing this. It is ridiculous and amazing. It's incredible. It's genuinely really brilliant. It's, if you never play mobile games or you rarely play mobile games, this is one to just dive into. It is not a golfing game. I used to play like Stickman Golf and that kind of thing back in the day. And like I got really sick of that type of game. This is not that. This is a dumb as all hell, like physics based game, which like riffs on other video games and plays with the whole notion of what golf kind of could be. And I'm having so much fun with it. It has the mechanic of golfing, mm -hmm. but it's not golf. It's, it's definitely not golf. I also like the way, I, I don't know, like, there's no spoilers for this. No. Like I recently played a level with a golf ball that was based on Mario, which yep. was awesome. Yeah. Sometimes it kind of flicks between uh, playing in three dimensions and playing in like 2D, mm -hmm. which I find quite interesting. It's like I actually really quite like the 2D levels. Yeah, quite yeah, a lot yeah. of, Well, the ones that I've played anyway, there's been quite a bit more skill in that so far yeah like how far are you in it like how many hours have you played this uh, uh, well, can we even measure this in hours because i played it for about half an hour i would say yeah i'm not sure how to measure it in hours just because i've yeah. kind of been dipping in here and there i, I think I've, the the counter on the start page says i'm about 20 percent through um oh okay so i'm at oh, a, you're i think you're much further yeah than I'm i think at, i'm like like single digits oh uh, yeah, yeah yeah i'm at a bit now where you need to do replay levels in order to get like you get these kind of crown things. I don't even understand what it's driving at, but you get these kind of crowns and you have to get a certain amount of them to get through the next section. So yeah, I've played, there's a whole kind of area which is all like based around cars and there's a whole area that's like essentially games of football, but as golf and... I just started that. Yeah. Well, you're, you're not too far behind me then. Okay. You kind of have to repeat that area, but like it's so much fun. It's really inventive even for the, the little amount of it really that we've both played. It's do, you know, do you know what it is as well? It's perfectly designed to be played on a phone. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you need a controller plugged into your phone to play. It is like you play it with your thumb in one hand mm -hmm. and it is glorious yeah it's really really good fun this is basically this is the first game that i played on uh, apple arcade and i'm totally addicted to it to the point <laughs> that i've not played any of the other ones no exactly yeah <laughs> I've, I've still been playing my apple arcade games like i play kind of console games where you're sort of working your way through one until you've sort of had enough of it yeah. so yeah i'm going to switch it up soon but like it's a great wee game just to have in the back pocket yeah if you haven't picked up apple arcade yet that's a great place to start. yeah i think it's definitely worth it like check it out for a month they do give you this free month and i think it's worth exploring like really i think that a lot of people will just immediately dismiss it because oh it's mobile games fuck that or are just like playing their match threes and thinking, nope, this is what I do in my phone. And it's just like, no, nope, it can be more than that, you know? Like, it can be better. And I think Apple's really shown, mm -hmm. no, look, we're taking this seriously now. Come and look at this stuff yeah. that we've got over here. And eat, like, even if you try it for that month and you don't like it, it's free. What have you got to lose, you know? Exactly. I wanted to ask you just before we move on, so we're coming up to like the absolute busiest period in the release schedule for the year and we're kind of both at this transition point where we finish control we're kind of dabbling about with apple arcade what are you playing next like what's coming up in your schedule link's awakening yeah categorically yes that's the straight up yeah. number yeah. one link's awakening hopefully finish that by the time death stranding comes out that is the current plan ah uh, you'll definitely finish it before death stranding comes out when's death stranding out? november 8th i think or if, yeah i think it's the 8th so um Okay. You've got like over a month. <laughs> I just I just bought my copy of Link's Waking and actually. Oh, did um, you just buy it? Yeah, oh, so it's in the post as we speak. So nice. I should get started that in the next few days. But yeah, just like October is absolutely stowed. So you've got um I'm really excited about Outer Worlds, which is coming up. Yeah. So there's some huge stuff. Um, I know. I I've kind of just come to accept <laughs> that I will not be playing all of these as they come no, out. No, absolutely not. No. It, is, it will be physically impossible. Death Stranding is the priority, mm -hmm. quite frankly, mm -hmm. in November anyway. And this month, it will be Link's Awakening. If I can get through that relatively quickly, maybe we'll have time for something else before then. But I also want to play the Farewell DLC for Celeste nice. as well, yeah. which I'm kind of hoping to get to sooner rather than later. And as well, now that we know what a release date for The Last of Us, I need to play The Last of Us Part 1 this year, which I reckon I'm going to play over Christmas. So that's where I've got up to. I've kind of got a loose kind of schedule <laughs> until I play The Last of Us Part 1 at Christmas. <laughs> um, speaking of Last of Us, that's how you do a transition, Lewis. <laughs> News item number one. The Last of Us Part 2 
Will they have no multiplayer loose? Now, this came as a shock to me as someone who had never played Last of Us. I am aware that it's one of the biggest black spots on uh, my gaming backlog. But I did not know this game had multiplayer. However, people were freaking the fuck out. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So speaking to US Gamer at the recent Last of Us press event, Lead designer Amelia Schatz explained that their focus was on the single player narrative. I fully was like, yep, all good. Didn't expect anything else. The internet disagreed. Subsequently, people were freaking out a bit and caused Naughty Dog to make this statement on Twitter. We wanted to address multiplayer in The Last of Us Part 2. As we've stated, the single-player campaign is far and away the most ambitious project Naughty Dog has ever undertaken. Likewise, as development began on the evolution of our factions mode from The Last of Us Part 1, the vision of the team grew beyond an additional mode that could be included with our enormous single-player campaign. Wanting to support both visions, we made the difficult choice that The Last of Us Part 2 would not include an online mode. However, you will eventually experience the fruits of our team's online ambition, but not as part of The Last of Us Part 2. When and where it will be realised is still to be determined, but rest assured we are as big a fan of factions as the rest of our community and are excited to share more when it's ready. Yeah, factions of course being being the multiplayer mode mm-hmm. in the previous game. Um, after that, Anthony Newman, who I believe is the game's director or co-director, uh, speaking to Polygon, then clarified further by saying that the game is developed, it is so ambitious, it is so grand in scope, it's so intricate in its complexities that it requires the full focus of the studio to deliver the single player experience. So basically between those two statements, it just sounds as if whatever they were planning on doing for the multiplayer is growing arms and legs. The single player campaign is bloomed into this enormous thing that I now know will be coming on two discs as well yep, for the PlayStation. Yeah. So it's a proper Red Dead <laughs> Yeah, it, it just seems as if they might physically have not been able to release this game as, like on the disc, which mm-hmm. means there would have been a, probably a gigantic day one patch, even if they were going to do it. And it seems as if that they also have some grand idea for what they want this yeah. multiplayer to be. I, I don't know. Like I, I had no interest in The Last of Us being a multiplayer experience. I actually wanted it to be quite, like, almost quite an isolated experience. Mm-hmm. So, like, I really didn't care about this. But what is interesting to me is that they do have this multiplayer idea, whether that ends up manifesting itself as The Last of Us or manifesting itself as something else, another game, another idea, remains to be seen. But I think that's quite exciting. It's great that Naughty Dog, uh, they've had so many ideas and they've got such big ambition that it's essentially created two games. There's a few things there, though. Like, you mentioned Red Dead, and that did come on two discs. And it also launched an online mode much later on so i don't really see why they couldn't do that which makes me think that they well maybe they maybe, are maybe they it. will yeah. maybe, well, they, maybe they will but it seems like what the, that statement's saying they we will see the fruit of our team's online ambition but not as part of the last of us part two which makes it sound like it is going to be a separate thing so i don't know it, may, it does make me think as the as the idea here that we're going to splinter off and i I think that that could work quite well, whether that's like just a, a you know, a free to play kind of online shooter set in that universe that could be really interesting. I, I'm the same as you, like I never played Factions, I knew it existed, but I had never played it, didn't really interact with it, didn't realise it had the following that it seems to have. No, me neither, man. Yeah. Like when this all kind of kicked off and people were like really gutted about it, I was like, I completely associated The Last of Us with this just... Uh, singular amazing like god of war-esque single player Mm. experience you know it just yeah it seemed to fly under the radar but have quite a big following by the sounds of it so yeah when people were like freaking out about this i was like really i was like (laughs) like, really this is what we're going to get annoyed about but yeah there you go like i'm quite excited to see what they're doing because this sounds as if they could have like another game in the works here and i'm like oh oh, here we go i think if you're a fan that's annoyed about this you should actually see their statement in response to it as quite an exciting positive thing you you're going to get your time with this huge ambitious last of his part two and then you've probably got something else possibly set in that universe which is really interesting coming down the lines so. yeah i think the thing is that people are like oh well, you need to pay for mm. it twice like this should all be the one game and but i mean if it's big enough to be a second game then all right well exactly like, yeah. <laughs> like i've got no problem with that um i, th- I know that there's been some chat that maybe oh they'll have this big secondary launch um, to coincide with the PlayStation 5. Uh, Do you know what I mean? Nah, they're sly bastards, aren't yeah. they? They're sly bastards. <laughs> Naughty dogs. <laughs> well done. That was that that was a real joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of chat about that as well, which, again, I actually think makes a lot of sense. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. we're probably talking, well, this time next year, we're mm-hmm. probably talking, maybe we'll maybe we'll see what what comes of this, this multiplayer thing. But yeah, 
I, th- I think it's really interesting. It's definitely something to follow anyway. All right, and news item number two. FIFA 20 has launched and it is the most successful launch of 2019 in the UK. However, the game appears to be terrible. <laughs> there seems to be a huge amount of issues, mainly around uh, the career mode, which is awfully buggy, it sounds like. And it sounds as if there is other bugs in the game oh, yeah. with career mode. However... The crux of the complaints seem to be seem to be uh, around career mode. It seems that a lot of the problems were actually a hangover from the previous game, from uh, FIFA 19, uh, which I think has just frustrated fans even more that they've already been living with us and we're expecting this to be fixed in the latest instalment. And it seems as if the problems prevail. And the the kind of attitude around this is that the the career mode of FIFA has been long neglected in favour of the ultimate team which is the segment of the game which is riddled with microtransactions and Mm. loot boxes and some of the most predatory stuff in video games (laughs) so there we go and in fact it was so bad that in the UK the hashtag uh, fix career mode was actually trending and we get all this positive stuff from EA it's like yeah we're changing we're doing the right thing and then just when these sports games come out, it's just like fuck them. Do you know what I mean? It's just, it's just the same shit because they'll buy it yeah, and we it don't care. Yeah, the, I mean, there's so many issues involved here. The, the idea that they have been neglecting career modes, which historically is the heart of any sports game, really. These like career campaign type modes. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, certainly, I mean, I have not played a FIFA no, in a have for very, years, yeah. very long time, but that, that was always the cool thing to do. Like, you built your own team, you, like, it got to the point where you could, like, build your own characters mm. and things like that, and you had, like, this run where you were trying to be so successful, you were trying to win your league, win the Champions League eventually, and yeah, that, that was a lot of the a lot of the fun of a single player experience yeah. in those games, you know? And it just, it sounds like it's got so kind of bad and gone so wrong that, like, it's completely unrealistic. Teams are winning that like, would never win in real life one thing I was reading was suggesting that like one or two teams are just buying up all the good players and so you can't you just can't really engage yeah, with yeah, it so, so something that I was reading is like, like say a team like uh, Man City or something like like a really big team would have like five of the top ten best goalkeepers in the world yeah. and it's just like what? Yeah. but if you were to play them then they would play a bunch of reserves yeah it's crazy and, stuff and, and you would win like five nil <laughs> but they have this absolutely all star team but they're all on the bench Yeah, it seems that they've just totally totally whiffed on this like, <laughs> like I, have, I don't even know what to say about that I, I don't know how you can release a game which is which has obviously been play tested they might like they must know that that's happening but they've went no it's okay put mm-hmm. it out i don't know how they could have possibly have come to that decision when fundamental things about the game are so badly wrong yeah and it's things that like these modes like you say they've not been updated much over the years and so to get them so wrong particularly in this one you're like what have you done to the to the systems here like what have you changed that's happened made this happen and EA have responded already with a statement that doesn't really go super far but they essentially said that like there, there's this one issue with like fixture congestion when games get moved for TV or whatever and they've sort of said like oh that was a late decision like a late change and we didn't realize what the consequences were going to be and they've said that um the thing about the, like one of the a- issues is that in press conferences in career mode i'm taking all of this from a Eurogamer article which we'll share on the yeah i've got i've got the same yeah. Eurogamer article uh all the articles in the show notes as always yeah. over at players com. but actually there's a really good article it's, yeah it's really good it really concisely like it breaks down, the Boils it all down. The game, yeah but yeah so one of the things is that you're being asked things in press conferences which have absolutely no relation to what is happening in your game so you're being asked about relegation when you're actually in the top four or whatever and they've basically just said it was like an issue that they couldn't find in the development cycle which means like the QA just hasn't been done properly they, they just couldn't that, find that's it that's literally what the, the quote says we were unable to find th- that issue during the development cycle but the, but the decision isn't then all oh, right well put, put it, it on the it, disc yeah. get it out <laughs> that's not the thing it's like no we delay it and we fucking fix yeah. it that's what, just, what um, kind of response is that, that it's, is it's quite a mad thing wild. to say publicly and i guess like you just cannot delay a fifa game like that's probably what their attitude is but this is fairly substantial stuff if this is the kind of core gameplay yeah. for a lot of people i know so. i know that like like gamers on the internet and like outrage culture and all that is always like oh this game's broken this is crap uh like this is absolutely trash and whatever like for for games that are like completely not mm. that way at all and like maybe there's kind of a few problems with it but that's fundamentals that's fundamentals of what the game is or what the game should be mm-hmm. that don't work so to, I, I think that this this might be one of the rare circumstances under which 
saying that the game is, quote, broken. Like, I don't know how else to describe that. No. But more to the point, you've just said to me now that they knew that yeah. and they put it out anyway. That is, I guess what that they- is unacceptable. I mean, see, to be honest with you, there, there has to be, again, this will be a very unpopular opinion, but this is getting into, like, legislation. Like, you can't, you can't sell people things that don't work. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's, that's a, a fundamental of retail in <laughs> most of our world countries. Do you know what I mean? I don't know how you can get away with that. That's completely unacceptable. Yeah. Well, that, this is, you know, don't pre-order games. That's the first thing. That <laughs> Wait until this stuff comes out and you understand what the issues are because... Pre-order games selectively. I don't want to say that. As a well, okay, okay, yeah. Because a lot of games need, it, need yeah. to, for the game to come out in the first place. Games like this simply do not, though. No, FIFA does not. And FIFA have got the money, trust me. Just while we're on retail and money, and, and another good little segue there, and we don't really have time to go into this. Of the segues <laughs> here, man. In too, too much depth just now. But do you know about the Switch edition for this? Kind of peripherally. Yeah. It's, it's called, I know, it's, it's called like FIFA Legacy. Legacy. Say, yeah. yeah so it's not the full game as i understand it it's, and i know that the on metacritic and we'll get into the metacritic <laughs> in a minute as well don't be a slave to that metacritic but oh boy <laughs> so i understand that it's not the full game and that i know that it's reviewed very very badly yeah it's essentially like this may be too simplistic and i don't know too much about it but it is essentially just fifa 19 but with squad and strip updates it's just like there is none of the actual gameplay innovation that the full edition has it's just essentially a reskin, which to me feels like that should have been sold as like an update patch on the previous FIFA game, not as a full price title uh, as it is being sold on Switch. So this is another kind of botched launch from EA. It seems to me problems in the in the base game, horrible, aggressive consumer uh, behavior on the Switch edition, a lot to be looked into. But yeah, that, that Metacritic score, I take it you're talking about the user score in particular. Yeah, so... The critic score of FIFA 20 is a 79, which 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 isn't very good, right? But considering the issues here, that seems extraordinarily high. Mm-hmm. But the user score is 1.3. I'm not sure I've ever seen a game that low. Yeah. I've seen a game like, like Fallout 76, which had a famously catastrophic <laughs> launch, was still at like a four. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen anything that low. That's crazy. It's got, oh my God, sorry, I've, I've actually just scrolled down, right? It's got 577 negative reviews. That is unbelievable. And this isn't a community that I feel like normally comes out in, in kind of force and, and in voice. No, because it's things. because it's it's played a lot by casual gamers. You know what I mean? It, yeah. it, it just, I'm not saying that as an insult to anyone who's really into FIFA. I mean, if you're into FIFA, like, great. I'm not saying that mm. as, as a negative at all, but it is played by a lot of casual people. Like, there's a lot of people that in a year will only buy three or four games and one of them is probably FIFA and another one's probably Call of Duty. Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's just the way a lot of people consume games. They they play games like this. They play the same like franchises. Yeah, like annualised franchises. Annualised yeah. franchises over and over and over again. And, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. But yeah, it's not necessarily a community that I would associate with being very vocal online. It's not like a gamer's game. Yeah. You know what I mean? But yeah, I'm, I'm I'm kind of glad that there is some backlash to this because it, look, it sounds fucking awful. Like it sounds <laughs> really, really bad. All right, and moving on to news item number three. PlayStation has started selling hardware directly through its stores. So you are able to buy consoles, accessories, games, PSVR, um, you're even able to sell bundles. This is all currently only available in the US, but I mean, surely this is a sign of things to come, Mm. uh, assuming that it's successful in the US. I also know that if you're a PlayStation Plus subscriber, you get uh, priority delivery, which is like an Amazon Prime sort of thing. So like you get like one day deliveries in the US. Again, it's just another show that people like PlayStation and Xbox and Nintendo, I suppose, as well, just do not need retail anymore game shops are are dying and i really think that things like this will be another nail in the coffin because if they if they're already losing customers to like amazon for buying new consoles and things like that but then if you can just get it directly from playstation it's like how how do we compete now do you know what i mean i think that it's just it's just another bad sign for high street stores oh absolutely yeah 
it's exactly that, that those shops that was all they had going for them in that kind of online competitive space was that people would come in and buy stuff directly from them and take it home that day and if playstation can undercut them it's, it seems like it might be future proofing from from sony to say like we know that this is going to happen so we better take some control over our own retail but, yeah well at least let's have this infrastructure in place and yeah, let's have this yeah. as a norm where you can come to us directly mm-hmm. to, to buy our products i mean ultimately it'll probably be the most expensive place that you can buy them probably uh, <laughs> But but nonetheless, it's it's just a sign of things to come. You yeah. know, I, I think that the days of PlayStation and Xbox and, again, Nintendo to a certain extent, although they kind of march to the beat of their own drum, but um, the days of them fighting for shelf space in supermarkets and things like that, I think that's just done. I think that's over. I don't think they give a shit, quite frankly, <laughs> about, about, about brick and mortar stores anymore. <laughs> it would be so interesting to see when the next gen launches how many of those consoles are bought at brick and mortar stores and how many of them are bought online either from playstation directly or if xbox responds and does something similar and from xbox directly or from amazon or just just online even if it were from like for here in the uk like if it were like from like game online yeah or uh, if you're in america if it were like a uh, gamestop online rather mm-hmm. than actually going to a shop i would i would love to see those numbers because i bet that they are absolutely dwarfed oh yeah. online numbers yeah and only getting that gap's only getting bigger essentially I've never quite understood why people go to brick and mortar shops for hardware, like for actual like consoles rather than accessories, because I find it quite an odd thing to wander around holding something that's got that much value to it. Well, then Um, you just stick it in the car and up the road. Well, potentially, but like think about where games are in Glasgow. Like you can't very easily do that necessarily. So yeah, and in fact, one of where one of the shops is is now in a bus only zone. Yeah, (laughs) so so access to it's even more limited. All right, sticking with PlayStation. PlayStation now, on this very day, in fact, only a few hours ago, is getting a huge update by the sounds of it. Um, to the point that you might actually consider buying it, Lewis. I uh, probably am not going to buy it now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, we'll start with the price because PlayStation are uncharacteristically putting the price down. In the UK, it's going from twelve ninety nine a month to eight ninety nine a month. I can't remember what it is in, in the US, but I know that they're actually it's basically half. It's twenty dollars down to ten dollars. Bang! Yeah, there you yeah, go. Yeah. There you go. Um, and they will also be adding quote new popular games each month for a limited time. The the first four of these are God of War, GTA Five, Infamous Second Sons, and Uncharted Four. You'll be able to get them from today until January the second, twenty twenty. All of this is obviously to compete with Xbox Games Pass. I mean, yeah, blatantly, I would say. Yeah. Thoughts? Well, so and I think the other thing just to mention there that PlayStation Now is is also this kind of streaming and backwards compatibility kind of idea. Yes, so, exactly. So you can get old PlayStation 2 and 3 games, not one game no. for some reason. I don't really know why. <laughs> yeah, and it's a, it's a streaming service for, I think, most of the stuff, mm. but, but now you can actually download a lot yeah. of the games as well, similarly to Xbox Game Pass. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's just like they're kind of competing in slightly different ways. It's not like a straight one for one. Like, half in the price or reducing the price in this country at least is a good thing and might draw people in i just i don't even think that those four games is enough of an offer like most people Do you know what this announcement had to have mate this announcement had to have and you can play death stranding day one yeah and then you can yeah. play last of yeah. us day one in february exactly. that's what this announcement had to have yeah to properly draw people it's certainly in. all it's, their first it's party kind of, titles it's, it's a step in the right direction but it's a half a step when they needed a full step Bringing the price down, great, because the price of their service was quite frankly ludicrous mm-hmm. compared to what Xbox was offering. But I, I don't I don't think that they've went far enough. I mean, the fact that if you are signed up to Xbox Game Pass, Gears 5 comes out, bang, you've got it. Don't even worry about it. Don't worry about whether your order gets delayed. Don't worry about whether it arrives on time. Don't worry about whether or not your game stops shut down. Yeah. <laughs> just, uh, it's just there for you. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just there and ready to go, bang. That's what they needed, and they needed it for Death Stranding, and they needed it for Last of Us. Do you know what I mean? Because Death Stranding is coming out very, very soon, and we just had all the Last of Us news, like all the focus is back on these absolutely incredible PlayStation first party games. Why not ride that? You know, why yeah. not ride that into this? And I just don't think they'll went far enough. You know, no, they, they, you're absolutely right. They haven't gone far enough. I don't think it's going to be enough to tempt people back in because I mean, the whole world and their granny has already played Grand Theft Auto Five. No one, I don't think, is particularly bothered about Infamous Second Son to go and subscribe. To no, a new no. Thing. See, this is the thing: is that see, if you think about the monetary value mm-hmm. here, like you can get GTA for not a great deal no, of exactly. money these days. Infamous Second Son. I mean, if you're paying more than what eight quid for that, that's probably <laughs> too much. Yeah. And uh, sorry, what was the uh, one? Un- Uncharted, Uncharted 4, 4 which yeah. came out 
Wait, years ago like now. Th- four years ago? 20, yeah, 2015 sounds about right to me. Exactly. And even God of War now is a year and a half old. It's, you know, you're going to get reduced. I mean, it's a totally flagship game. Like, yeah. I understand that. And I understand that they couldn't have just went and play God of War, but like, they had to have more stuff there. Yeah. You know what I mean, the thing that, uh, the question that I kind of have about it though is, you know, they said there that these four games will be available from 1st of October till January the 2nd and that they'll add new stuff and that this, as they call it, marquee content is on top of the other stuff that is already on the service. Do you get to keep those games beyond January or is it a case of play them until January and then you, what, you have to no, buy I think, them again? I, I think they're gone, man. Yeah. Uh, well, that, that's certainly how I read yeah. it anyway. It's worth pointing out as well that they're going to add stuff each month yeah, yeah. As, as the service continues. Yeah. But it'll be interesting to see the quality of those games. Like, like, I don't know, like this just feels like not as good a deal as Xbox Game Pass. No. And it's cheaper. Do you, do you know what I mean? And it just doesn't feel as good because I don't think that the the quality of new games is there mm. and the promise that you can play first party games on Xbox on launch day is like is like so valuable mm. to that subscription service. And I think that if PlayStation had done that, I'd be sitting here going, I'm going to sign up right now. No problem. That is an absolutely superb yeah. service. Totally amazing. But because they don't have that, a wee bit like, yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. it's still going to take you several announcements before you're going to get me to even consider signing up to this. Whereas, yeah, well, I mean, what would it need to be? I, I think you're right. Like, if they, if they had said today, or if they are going to say soon, subscribe to PlayStation now, you'll get Death Stranding day and date. You know, as it comes out, it's yours, and you're effectively then saying, "I'm paying eight ninety nine for Death Stranding." You've got me because who wouldn't do that, right? Like, particularly that that game is so strange, and a lot of people might be put off by it. A lot of people will be like, "All right, I'll chuck my eight ninety nine in." And then I'll give it a bash. And if I don't like it, I'll just cancel the subscription. But at the moment, you look at that and you're like, okay, there's a bunch of old games. I mean, we like playing old games. We're playing old stuff, uh, SNES games oh, on, yeah, fuck yeah. on Switch just now. But it's, nothing against old games. No, man. but it's just, it's not enough to be like, I will subscribe. I will pay money every month. Like, you know, nine quid is not an, something to be sniffed at necessarily. It's not a lot of money, but it's still just like another subscription like on another top subscription. of the thing. Yeah, exactly. So if it's not absolutely killing it in terms of what it's offering, it's like, oh, nah, you're going to need to announce some bigger, better stuff than yeah. that. You know? Ladies and gentlemen, what I would recommend to you is is to sign up for this for one month, pay your eight ninety nine, <laughs> play God of War, bask in its glory, and then cancel the subscription yeah. unless something else amazing comes out <laughs> next month. <laughs> All right, and we'll just finish off with a few shout outs, although actually quite a lot of shout outs today. And sticking with PlayStation again, Sean Layden, chairman of SIE Worldwide Studios, and at Sushi Morita president of SIE Japan Asia, have are both leaving PlayStation. I don't think this is anything particularly to be uh, worried about. I know that Mr. Morita was like 60 yeah, or like he was retired, retiring age yeah, and yeah. is probably in no need of extra money. <laughs> and yeah, Sean Layden kind of came out of a bit of left field, but again, he's been there for a long, long, yeah. long, long, long time. I think he's been there for nigh on 20 years. Uh, I think it's over 30, actually. Oh, really? Is yeah, it? Oh, like, wow. like, so not I mean, right at the top, so, obviously. So, so yeah. our whole... Yeah, our, literally our whole... Our whole lives, lives <laughs> yeah. of PlayStation have been with him at, at least heavily involved yeah. I know that he, before he was chairman of the worldwide studios he was uh, in charge of like the, the North American branch um, yeah I, d- I don't think this is anything to worry about I, I just think it was kind of worth noting that there could be some change at the top yeah. with regards to PlayStation and so, uh, like I, th- I think the real story here will be where does he end up you know and that, that'll be something well, to talk well, that about will be, happens, that will you know? be very interesting because unlike Reggie fils mm. who left Nintendo of America last year Something yeah, like, just a, or the beginning of the year around then. Yeah, yeah, I, I can't, I can't really remember actually. Um, he he like retired, where Sean Le- Layden is leaving, so it might resurface somewhere. Be interesting to see. Anyway, I don't think this is any problem. Uh, I think that the reason that this is happening now is that October is uh, the end of the financial year. I was reading for with Sony and for I think a lot of kind of Japanese companies. So I, I think yeah. that this was just the time that it was going to happen, sort of thing. So yeah, but interesting, interesting to see what comes of that. Something to keep an eye on anyway. Mm. Next shout out is Cuphead. Cuphead has sold 5 million copies they announced on their second birthday, which was only a few days ago, and that they will be having a 20% off sale on all platforms, which I thought was really, really cool. This only lasts a week, and by the time you hear this podcast, dear listener, you will only have a couple of days to take advantage of that. So if you haven't played Cuphead, one, you should definitely, definitely play Cuphead. And two, yeah, make sure you take advantage of this offer. You know what I mean? 20% off is like quite a big deal. Sales come and go, but if you want to play it now, this is a good opportunity. Next up, Mortal Kombat 11 is adding a team raid mode. This was bizarre <laughs> when I read this. This was very strange. This will see a three-player co-op team take on a large enemy. I 
I really have no idea how this is going to manifest. I, I don't have a picture in my head so, of how this is going to work. I was what re- are your thoughts? I was reading about it earlier, and so it seems like in, in brief that basically for you as the player, you'll just see your character on screen and the boss. But effectively, that boss has three health bars and they're being depleted simultaneously across all three battles. And so you get buffs and debuffs and all that kind of, you know, all these augments that Mortal Kombat 11 added. So, so you're not going to see no. the other two players. It'll just look like you fighting a big boss. Yeah. So yeah, so that's basically it. So you have to work together and cooperate to use the buffs and augments and all that kind of thing to do better in this fight. I'm assuming it's not just a fight against like Shao Kahn, but with more uh, slightly more health or whatever. I, I'm assuming it's going to be like designed the boss fights, either designed boss fights or an existing character, but with like heavy kind of you know measures against you, so that it's not just like if you're really good at the game, you'll just win anyway. You know, as you would do in a fight against a normal mm. you know boss within the. So the you game can't just rely on one player. I think not. Person. Yeah, it's, it's going to be like a long battle. But that is, it's very weird. That's <laughs> very strange. I don't know I mean, why I must they want to it ever thought that it would be that you wouldn't be able to see the other two players <laughs> i was like trying to think of how are they going to do this like they would need to like scale out the map yeah. so that you could see your players and then your characters would be smaller or something yeah. was kind of what i was thinking but yeah i don't know about this one i would actually be quite interested to go back to mk11 and try it but yeah i'm not sure quite how successful that's going to be because i think it's been met with quite a lot of skepticism and, <laughs> and, and not even like anger but just like what yeah like, what why <laughs> it doesn't seem like something the game was crying out for particularly no, I, I definitely so. don't think it was <laughs> all right next shout out is the star wars jedi fallen order we got a story trailer what were your thoughts on this i really liked it yeah i, I was quite taken with cool. it like i've always been fairly looking forward to jedi fallen order but yeah this new story trailer i think it's called cal's mission and it's got gameplay within it or like at least in-game stuff yeah we'll um, put a link to the show notes yeah. uh, to the video and flourish.com definitely um but yeah i just thought like i thought the combat looks really good i think like it's doing something quite interesting with the star wars brand like there's a lot of enemy types and creatures and stuff that we've not seen in any of the films yeah before, it does so. show i mean i know every game under the sun gets compared to dark souls these days right so just t- take us <laughs> with a pinch of salt i don't like doing it either but the boss fight was kind of presented in a very dark soul sort of way Absolutely, I, yeah. I thought and and again the combat's been presented in a very dark soul sort of way we've been told that it's going to be me, uh, sort of metroidvania-esque in its level design like I, I think the people came out of the the e3 trailer like quite negative and for all and i kind of understood it to a certain extent to be honest with you i didn't actually think that the trailer that they showed there was that good but you could see bits though mm-hmm. you could see parts of it that you were like oh this could be this could be really cool. Yeah, I think a lot of people were expecting it to play faster, but actually, I think that the slow, more deliberate, actually kind of ties more into the uh, the current trilogy of movies that we're seeing as well, as opposed to the prequel trilogies where they were all flying about like space ninjas. <laughs> um, and, and I think that it just plays so much better. And it, like when you feel the weight of the lightsaber, when you feel the power of the force, you know. I mean, I think that that I think that that's ultimately going to play better in their favor. You know. Yeah, I, I'm. I, I thought it looked great. I thought yeah, it looked no, good, absolutely good, good, great. Good, yeah. like, I really did. I, I didn't quite know what you were going to think. I, about th- I thought you were going to come in with yeah. negative there. So no, that's, no, that's no. Good. I really <laughs> thought it looked really good. I was surprised at how much I liked it. Mm. I don't think that it looks graphically that good. No, I'm I, going to be straight. Like even in the trailers, I, the gra- like there's something about his face. I, I, I said that right at the beginning, and I got really? laughed at for saying it. But yeah, I've never thought that the character design looks fantastic I, no, for, I, for him. No. And I know he's based on a, a real actor as well. I think. I, so, I say, oh God, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <bro. laughs> I think it's the guy who plays um, like the Joker character in the Gotham TV show. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I think so. I don't watch that, so I'm not 100% No, I, sure, I, I but, yeah. don't watch either, but I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. And so, like, yeah, it's weird that it doesn't quite like look like a real person would look, <laughs> but um, I, I'm willing to put that aside because I think like the universe, so to speak, yeah. looks really yeah. cool it and like, well put together. It seems to be uncharted so. with Metroidvania level design with Dark Souls style combat and bosses. And lightsabers. And lightsabers. I mean, I mean, it's kind of difficult to not no, want exactly. to play that, you yeah. know? <laughs> And like, given how and I much... totally trust Respawn, exactly. Well. That... Like, they've they've not put a foot wrong, so I I totally trust them to pull this off. Quite frankly, yeah. And I really really hope that they do. I really hope they do. And we've been promised no fucking microtransactions. Well, that's what I was just about to say. You can trust Respawn up to the hilt, but can you trust EA not to do something completely absurd with this? Absolutely not. <laughs> but we'll see. We'll see. Speaking of Respawn. Next shout out is Apex Legends Season 3. Got a cool little trailer. Did you watch this? I haven't seen the trailer. No, no. You're not mad into Apex. I must admit, I, I got kind of deep into it for a wee while. I got deep into it in Season 1. Uh, it was definitely my Battle Royale of choice. 
totally missed season two altogether. Uh, never played as Watson once, uh, but we're now getting a new character called Crypto. Um, coming with a whole new battle pass as well. But the big announcement here really is the new map, which is it has like a lot of frozen areas, but with a volcano in it, so it's like kind of fire and ice. Mm-hmm. I, I thought that it looked really cool. It has like a moving train going around it as well. It looks as if you could get some like environmental damage as well, nice, potentially yeah. if you you walk in front of it. I can't really remember there being any other environmental damage in Apex, to be honest with you. So I think that you can like get hit with this train. You can see like people trying to like snipe people on the train. It just looked quite cool. Nice, yeah, yeah, it just looked like quite a good map. It, made, it did make me want to jump back in, which I suppose is what I feel was wanting to do. <laughs> um, do you think so, that you will? Do, like, um, I don't know. Like, I'm almost slightly apprehensive about jumping back into games like this after such a long time being mm. away. But... Um, yeah, maybe, maybe. I'd be quite keen to try the new map, to be cool. honest. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, piqued my interest, definitely. All right, and the last shout out is just for your Games With Gold Epic Game Store free games and PlayStation Plus free games. We're all about the free games here. Um, so your Games With Gold this month are Tembo, the Badass Elephant. How good a game name <laughs> is that? Uh, Friday the 13th, Disney's Bolt. Ninja Gaiden 3 Razor's Edge so go and check that out let me know what Tembo the Badass Elephant is because it sounds insane <laughs> <laughs> um, free to play on the Epic Game Store this month is Minute actually which is oh, a nice, yeah. cool little indie and if you're listening to this podcast on the day that it comes out it will be your last chance to get Metro 2033 Redux on the Epic Game Store if you want that go and get it it's free why wouldn't you and on PlayStation Plus just a reminder from last week it will be The Last of Us Part 1 and MLB The Show. Definitely get that Last of Us Part 1, particularly if you want some Last of Us multiplayer, I've realised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, time for a little break. Back for Topic of the Week. And we are back with Topic of the Week. Topic of the Week this week is our play along of Braid, which I was very excited to do. I, I think I mentioned this on the podcast a couple of times, but I actually only played this game kind of as we were launching this podcast actually so it must have been back in what may june, june, yeah, may, yeah. june i was i uh, i've played this for the first time and quite frankly i cannot believe it took me that <laughs> long to play it the game is by a gentleman by the name of jonathan blow it originally came back in 2008 so it's actually over 10 years old this game which i actually couldn't really believe yeah to be honest when i was playing it I think this game is incredibly important. It literally changed the way the industry looks at independent games and independent game design. What Jonathan Blow did with Braid was really show the world that a game could be financially successful and tell an absolutely amazing story and have really interesting mechanics and be done in this indie setting. You didn't need people upon people upon people upon people and... I, at the time when it came out, you need to understand as well that indie games weren't weren't thought of in the same way as they are today. Like games like Braid weren't a dime a dozen back then. They they didn't really exist. You kind of had your your big triple A's. You had some what we would call double A's, mm. and then beyond that, you just kind of had like trashy games. And, and until this sort of era where online games or, or buying games online and just downloading them yeah. straight to a console or your PC, before that really existed, independent games never really had a space. Like, they never had a space on, or not a lot of them certainly had a space on mm-hmm. shelves. You know what I mean? That that wasn't something that, that wasn't something that existed. And it was kind of with, the, like, the dawn of Steam and, again, like, Xbox become, becoming more online-focused and PlayStation becoming more online-focused that games like this were able to take off. And, in fact, I was saying to you offline that this game was actually initially rejected by Steam. Yeah, or, which I had no idea about. Yeah, yeah so I, I, I was kind of watching an interview with uh, Jonathan Blow just to kind of, like, prepare for this uh, for this segment that we were doing. Yeah, apparently the game was rejected by Steam because, it, that, because they didn't think it was going to make the sales numbers. And then, subsequently, it was picked up by xbox live arcade which is uh as i understand it it doesn't need, it doesn't even exist <laughs> it doesn't yeah, even yeah. exist anymore but it was used at the time to showcase kind of smaller games kind of try to pick up indie games and kind of try to get that that scene going you know and that this was the first like absolutely universal critical acclaim and it's easy to see why it's a, it's an absolutely tremendous tremendous game and it ended up selling really well it got like well it was bought fifty five thousand times in like the first weekend wow, or whatever yeah. it came out like it is it sold really really well and I, i'm so glad that it did because i mean thinking of other amazing indie games that i've loved over the years things like well limbo and inside and even things like celeste and things like undertale 
that we've covered on this, even things like Into the Breach, which we've also done on this, like I'm not sure that there's a space for that game no. if Braid didn't exist. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm sure that the, the world was ramping towards that future anyway, and I'm sure it would have happened eventually, but I really genuinely believe that Braid was the catalyst for this in a lot of ways. And I'm sure that the, you can go back and find out, oh, well, actually, this indie game came out before it, and it's probably well to, <laughs> But yeah, but it, it, didn't, it probably didn't penetrate the zeitgeist no. in the way that Braid did, certainly not at the time, because it was it was a really big deal. Yeah, a really big deal is an understatement in a lot of ways. It's now like seen as one of the greatest games ever made, and it, I didn't know. I think rightfully so. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Like, honestly, like it's so it's so clever in what it's doing. Sh- should we describe what it's a, what it is exactly? It's essentially just a like, okay. It's like you, a, want, you want to have a stab at <laughs> yeah, that? Yeah, well, you go. <laughs> I mean, in its most basic form, it's a two D platformer essentially, which uses what seems at first to be a quite straightforward time travel mechanic, which means that if you miss time your jump or whatever, you can just rewind time. However, level by level, you new kind of twists on that are introduced. So in certain worlds, it might be that. Yeah. So so there's six worlds. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. within each world you get a new time travel mechanic exactly. and which is unique to that world that doesn't travel between yeah. worlds which I actually think is quite important exactly uh, and also a lot of the levels within worlds repeat again and again so you see how the same essentially the same puzzle is altered by the mechanic that you have in, at your disposal as well so just uh, to throw one out there in, in one of the worlds it's like as you move uh, from left to right time moves forward but as you move from right to left time reverses so you have to be conscious of the things that are happening around you uh, and kind of manipulate that by your movements so it's, it's things like that yeah I, and the way that the the puzzles are built around mm-hmm. these mechanics is i mean I, masterful sounds like it sounds too much yeah. but it really it yeah. really is is near perfect game design mm-hmm. like from before we even get into the story and and we're getting there <laughs> It is from a mechanical point of view. It is it is nearly perfect. I have I have almost no gripes at all no. about it. It is absolutely perfect in what it's doing. And now coming on to the story, the way that that marries as well to the narrative that has been told throughout this, which is again, I think as I mentioned in another podcast, like it is quite esoteric. It's quite easy to say that this is like super pretentious and yeah and Jonathan Bowes just making this as some sort of like art project and it's 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 all meaningless and and I think that there's actually like a point to that as well like I think that there's actually systems within the game that make you think that way for Mm -hmm. example like I know that one of the stars that you have to collect in the game can only be collected if you wait in a a level for two hours like two like two literal hours in your life for a small cloud to travel across the map to where you can jump on it to get another star yeah and like I, th- I think that there's don't be put off by that <laughs> don't, don't, don't be put off by that and actually i would don't bother with the, the stars and all that mm. because the point that he's trying to make about that is that like completion completing it for completing its sake is pointless mm-hmm. like it's th- there's no need for it you well i was going to say you don't actually gain anything from doing this but you actually do gain like a kind of pseudo second ending yeah but the first, the first ending is good enough. No, no, the, <laughs> fir- the first ending, the first ending is what really makes the fucking game. Yeah, though. exactly. Right, so, do, do you want right? Let's let's talk about let's talk about the narrative. Let's talk about the story. Go. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so you play it as a little guy called Tim, and essentially, I mean, it's really riffing on the kind of particularly on Mario and the idea of the. Yeah, it is. It really is. It's analogous to yeah. to Mario, but. I don't want you, dear listener, to think that that is all there is. No, no, no. It's not, not at just all. trying to riff on Mario. I mean, to the point that it actually says You're, the, the princess is in another castle. Is in another castle because it's this. Pr- the, yeah, the the, the the capital, the princess that you're going after. Exactly, yeah. So you you spend the game trying to find this princess, essentially, and you are working your way through these worlds, which kind of have their own little story beats to them, which is kind of tells you more about Tim and his experience of life and his way of thinking, and it's really... And it, really amazingly written. Yeah, quite um, densely written. It's not it's not an easy... The concepts that Jonathan Blow is putting into this game aren't necessarily easy story concepts to pick up on, but that doesn't mean that you don't basically understand what's happening throughout it. Yeah. And so, yeah, so you, as you work your way through, you keep finding the princess isn't there. And in some ways you feel like Tim is getting kind of more and more frustrated in certain parts or more and more kind of pensive and different. Each each world has a slightly different like emotional kind of mood to it. And yeah, basically it's that until it isn't that. <laughs> and I don't know what we yeah, can so, <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, I hope that you're aware that we are going to spoil this game. <laughs> um, but it all, it all leads to this point, like, like we were talking about 
with control L like it leads to this like amazing crescendo at the end of the game where you get to the final world and you see uh, the princess at the top of your screen then a man comes in and she starts running away and then you chase after her to catch up with her until the princess gets to what looks like her home mm-hmm. or castle yeah and then you climb up uh, a section what do you call those things that just like uh, trellis fencing yeah thing. exactly a bit of trellis fencing to get to the other side of our window and look in and then suddenly the whole game changes and where you then have to play this whole section in reverse where it then becomes clear that in actual fact tim is the one that she is running from and when you play this whole section in reverse it's not you chasing after the princess to get away from this guy is the princess running away from you to get to this guy who is saving her yeah it sounds when i say that out loud as if i'm not doing it justice because (laughs) because when that happened in the game i was like oh my god it's it's changed everything i I don't want to say this in a sort of like hyperbolic way but it it changed your perspective of every other fucking thing that you did in the whole game absolutely yeah in that one moment Mm -hmm. and it was done again absolutely masterfully i think it was done so brilliantly yeah it, it really was one of my favorite gaming moments ever and you like, didn't like, you, like quite honestly you didn't know that i was had coming never spo- no. i had never had it spoiled for me no. and i was so lucky getting right getting around to that moment and not having it spoiled for me was just amazing so i'm sorry listener that we've just spoiled <laughs> it for you but it held such weight it, it really did and in a way that i really wasn't expecting like what? What was your experience? So of that? yeah, I, I, we seem to be like pinning it all on this ending as well. Like the game before that is still fantastically good. Yeah, I mean that that, is, that can't be stressed enough. Like, see, even if you couldn't read the text in the game, like if you didn't have any understanding, I would go so far of, as to say that you don't have to. Read no, the text exactly. In the game. Like you, you can play each stage of this game, and it is so fun to play and so kind of interesting mechanically that it's got that going for it alone. But like you say, like the ending changes things so drastically and it even makes you think again about what, in this kind of story world, what did those time travel mechanics mean? It's sort of about, you've been thinking of it all along as trying to undo some mistake that Tim has made because it's like the first thing that you're told that he's made this mistake and he wants to undo it. But then he's, after this twist at the end, you're like, oh, actually, like what, how complicit in something terrible am I here? Like, what is it that I've been building towards? Yeah, um, it's, it's, ama- it's an amazing it's what, probably the best case of unreliable narration yeah. that I've seen and like b- people would go on about say like the usual suspects mm-hmm. and things like that I, I just think that this has done so much more beautifully mm-hmm. than, than almost anything that I've ever seen before yeah and completely uh, without like there's no way while you're playing it that you think this is what's coming and then when it does you just reevaluate everything the kind of reason that I got really interested in the game in the beginning it was like an old friend an old colleague that recommended it to me while I was still at university the game had been out for two or three years at that point and I was just a bit like jaded with with gaming at that point like this was kind of around the time where like the call of duties and the repetitive assassin's creed and stuff were just like the absolute dominant force in gaming and i just wasn't really doing it anymore and this guy told me like you should check this out it's really interesting it's got this great story interesting mechanic stuff and i'd never played anything on steam before it was the first steam game i ever played and the idea that this could talk about gaming itself within the game like it is commenting on the mechanics that we're so used to in games and the way stories are told and the role of the player and the hero character like to go back to mario and i don't like it's not a mario game at all right but like you're a um, little man who jumps it's kind yeah, of no, no, I, mean, um, yeah. I mean i mean we're, i mean we're saying it's not a mario game and it's, yeah. it's not a mario game but it's playing heavily up yeah. to mario i mean but i don't it, think like, there's any problem and it's absolutely like based- but, but i feel that saying oh it's a game that like plays up to mario is like cheapens it yeah totally and, and it, i don't want it but to it, do because that. It's, it's it's so much more than that because it's partly like a critique of mario and it's ilk it's kind of saying like like what is Mar- like who is this mario guy like why is he chasing this woman around and killing all these things and like are we supposed to be okay with that like but you don't think about any of that until this twist happens so you've actually gone through the motions of solving these puzzles and getting to this point only to be told like oh no like you're the villain here like you're doing the weird thing of chasing this woman around this world you need to think about what you've done there and like that just is such an interesting thing in a world particularly at that point when i was playing it where games were like draw your sword kill everyone in the room you know run into this multiplayer map and shoot everyone 40 times until you win and suddenly this game braid was going like play with these interesting mechanics think about what you're doing and immerse yourself in this world it's got this whole other kind of slant to the story which a lot of people read in it that it's a comment on the creation of the atomic bomb which yeah but it's 
there's I, there's stuff like actually in the game about yeah, it. Yeah, there are. There, I don't think it's Oppenheimer, but there are. Yeah, but there are, but but there are quotes about the atomic bomb and about the yeah. Manhattan Project. But I mean, to say that it's about the atomic bomb is to say that it's a riff on Mario as well. Like it's it's it, it cheapens it. It's it's not what it's about. No, not there, only there, what there it's are about aspects of yeah. that in it, and as well, like I can't remember what the exact quote was, but like when Tim meets the princess again, they will be there will be a force and a blinding light that will consume the world or mm-hmm. something like that. Again, spoiler alert, like the, the secret ending, like you catch the princess and the screen goes white and mm. she explodes. Yeah. It's an, it's just an analogy. It's not yeah. it's not about that. No, not at all. But it's it's, it's it, and again, I, I really think that and I, I don't want I, I would really hate for people to get like hung up on like some of these things, like because it's not like that. It's not some, no. It's not some weird comment about nuclear war or something. But it's like a, that. it's a comment it's, on it's an, the creation a, of that in terms of like we as humans make mistakes that we wish we could undo and we cannot undo them. Yes. And in this game, you can, but that also has consequences and it reveals things about yourself within the game world that are horrifying. And yeah, that, that's what it's doing. Again, it's not it's, about it's just the bomb like, itself. It also, it, it has like a kind of pseudo commentary on death as well, and it's yeah. all just woven into this. It, intentionally vague very open interpretation story that's just it's just absolutely superb and we do need to kind of wrap things up here i realize that we're probably running on a bit late oh god we definitely are (laughs) um but i i think i would be remiss if i didn't say anything about the visuals of Mm. this game which are absolutely stunning they are all hand painted as far as i'm aware even so far as i know there's a part in the game where you have to like kill five of the wee things that we will call goombas for mm. uh shorthand here <laughs> but the checklist at the top is like five pictures of goombas that they just get crossed out as you kill them. kill them like they are all unique drawings oh, <laughs> of, really? of a goomba yeah, it's, yeah. Well. it's not like a copy and paste yeah it's like it's just a beautiful level of detail and the the music which is repetitive but amazing yeah it's I really absolutely gorgeous yeah love the music yeah. and every time i hear the music now i'm just like ah oh, fucking braid man <laughs> it's, it's just it's just so good and particularly is it the final world where it's all in reverse so all the music is in yeah, reverse yeah. Well, well anytime you reverse it does yeah, kind yeah. of go backwards but yeah particularly in the last world it goes in reverse and because it is now being revealed that tim is the bad guy it actually sounds quite sinister yeah. in reverse but it's literally just the soundtrack yeah. in reverse but it's, it's amazing what you project onto totally, that in, yeah. in that situation is it is a truly truly superb game and I cannot believe that I've only got around to playing it. I should have played it years ago. It it really ha- it really has <laughs> kind of made me think a lot about what games can be and what the true art that can be in games. You know, definitely. All right, I think we'll probably call it a day there. But uh, we have to announce our game for October now. Our play along for October, and it's going to be God of Goa. This is a game you haven't played. This have I have you? not. No, I've been excited to for a while, but I haven't touched it yet. Again, no. it's a very, very artsy game. We will say, but I, I again think that is a true masterclass in game design and in puzzles. Nice. And again, it has an absolutely beautiful hand drawn art style. I think that everyone will love this if they play it on mobile. And I really think that your mobile phone is the ideal place to play this, which is perhaps an odd statement you can get it anywhere if you don't want to play it on your phone then f- feel free not to but i played it on my phone and i thought that it was just the bit the perfect place to play it it was it was almost perfect for a phone i know that it wasn't really designed to be on a phone yeah it, it literally is just kind of moving cards around it's a relatively short experience it depends on how good you are at solving the puzzles <laughs> i would say but it's, it's it's really great and i'm quite excited to talk about it as well because again it made me think a lot about kind of puzzles and games and how you can tell a story in a game through its mechanics without necessarily being blatant about what you're trying to say do you yeah. know what i mean like it's and, and it's similar to, to braid in a lot of ways where it's it's intentionally vague but it's nonetheless telling quite an interesting story about this man on a sort of journey we'll say We're okay just gonna okay okay there. And just to remind everyone that you can find players too on all the social media that's facebook twitter youtube instagram the lot you can find our written content over at players2.com. That's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S-T-O-O.com. And if you like anything that you've heard here, please, 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 please take five seconds to give us five stars over on Apple Podcasts. It really does a huge amount for the exposure of the show. It pushes up the charts, all that good stuff. There is a reason that every podcast that you listen to asks you to do this because it is really important. And if you're thinking, oh yeah, I'll get around to that later, just uh, just, just pause, just go, just go and do it now. It's cool, it's cool. really helps us out. Thank you very much as well to anyone who's already done that for us. You are all legends. Thank you. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen. See you next week. Thanks. 